after defining the good market equilibrium for an open economy, now we want to move on to talk about the saving and investment which is related to the goods market equilibrium in a small open economy. When we talk about small open economy, we need to first define what is so-called a small open economy. So in economics, when we say something is really small, we often refer the scenario that something is too small to affect the price. Therefore, from the international economics perspective, when we say a country is a small open economy, then it means that it's too small to affect the world interest rate. Therefore, for such an economy, it faces the world interest rate and it just take it as given and then they cannot change the interest rate at all because it is too small to affect the price. Then because of that, the resident of this small open economy can borrow and lend at whatever amount and then they will not be affecting the world interest rate at all. That is because they add up to be too small to affect the world price. Therefore, they just take the price as given and then deciding what will be the amount of the lending and borrowing they want to have to their best interest. So now let me draw the goods market equilibrium under such a case. So similar to what we had before, when we want to come up with the saving and investment equilibrium for an economy, we draw a diagram with the vertical axis is R, which is the real interest rate. The horizontal axis is the saving and investment desired. The saving slopes upward because when the real interest rate is higher, people prefer to save more. The investment curve slopes downward because when the real interest rate is higher, people prefer to invest less. So then for a small open economy, given that they are given an interest rate, that's assumed if they are given an interest rate like the R in here. So this result implies that the economy is facing the real world interest rate that equal the R1. Then in that case, we know the saving desire of this nation will be greater than the investment in this nation. So that it means that they have more savings than their domestic investment. So then they are going to have something left. So then there is a net foreign lending position. It's positive and it is a net lender. Then given that what we learned before, we say that it also implies that the net export is positive. So for this economy, it will also have trade surplus. How about if the economy is facing the world real interest rate that is at the position of the R3? Then it means that the domestic investment will be greater than the domestic savings, which implies that its net foreign lending is negative. So it is a net borrower. So then in that case, it also implies that its net export is negative. So it also have the trade deficit. So then finally, if this economy turned out to have the world real interest rate exactly equal to the domestic equilibrium real interest rate, which is R2, then it implies that the domestic saving equals the domestic investment. So it has zero foreign lending, and also it implies that it has the zero net export, so it has the zero balance trade. So that's the goods market equilibrium for a small open economy. So then what will be the effect of any economic shock in a small open economy? We claim that overall, when the shock rises, the desired national saving, for example, there is higher current income, lower future income, or lower government expenditure, then the desired national saving should rise. Under that case, if the rise is greater than the increase of the desired investment, for example, due to an increase in the future marginal product of capital or a fall in the tax, then given a world interest rate, then the net foreign lending position will increase because the gap between the desired national saving and the investment becomes larger, then it means that the saving minus investment is greater, so then it implies that the net foreign lending will increase. 
and it also will have more net exports. On the contrary, if the increase of the desired national saving is small there relative to the increase of the desired investment, then it implies that the net foreign lending should fall. So now here comes two examples. The first example I want to show you is about an increase in the expected future marginal product of capital, which only raises the investment desire. So in here, I also draw the saving and investment diagram. We know that for the economy, which faces the world interest rate that is much higher than the domestic equilibrium real interest rate, then the domestic investment need to be less than the domestic savings because the interest rate is higher than the equilibrium so then the saving is more than the investment so this economy is a net lender then how about if the economy faces the world interest rate in here then it means that the saving and investment coincide so then it has a zero borrowing and lending position Finally, if this economy faces the interest rate position in R3, then it means that its saving is less than its investment. Therefore, it implies that this economy is an international borrower. So then now the economy faces a shock that increased the investment desired. So then what happened is that with the increase in the investment desire, it will shift the investment curve to the right. Then it means that the original size of the international lending now shrink. That is because the original size was in blue and now it becomes in yellow. How about for the country that faces the world real interest rate that is R2? Well, it turned out that economy will move from the position with zero international lending and borrowing to a position that its investment now becomes greater than its savings. In other words, it moves from an economy with no borrowing nor lending to an economy now has net borrowing. Finally, for an economy that used to face the world interest rate that is at R3, then now the new international borrowing lending positions becomes those in purple. That is, it was originally borrowing an amount in blue, now it enlarges to become the size of purple. So in conclusion, we say that if the economy that used to be a foreign lender, then due to this shock, it will have its foreign lending size that falls, so then it implies that its trade surplus should also fall. For the economy that used to have the foreign borrowing position, then its foreign borrowing size should enlarge, which means that its trade deficit should enlarge. Finally, for an economy that used to have zero balance trade and zero lending and borrowing positions, then it will move from zero to net borrowing, which means that they used to have the zero balance, now they become to have a trade deficit. And that's the impact of an increase in the investment desire for a small open economy. Now let's take a look at a second case, which is for an economy that faces a temporary positive supply shock that increases the desired national savings. So then in that case, for an economy that faces the world real interest rate that is at R1, it means that before the shock, the economy in fact is having the investment is less than its domestic savings. So this will be the original size of its international lending. But then after the shock, given that the saving increases, so then what happened is that now they have more savings than before. So then the length of their international lending should increase. That is in yellow. So the result implies that the economy will lend more to the international goods markets. So then how about the, if the economy faces a world real interest rate that is at the level of R2? It means that before the shock, the economy have the zero balance. But then after the shock, 
now it has more savings than its investment, which means that its international lending and borrowing position turns from zero to be a net lender. How about if the economy is the type of economy that faces the world real interest rate at R3? Then it means that before the shock, its savings is less than its investment, so then its size of the international lending and borrowing position is that it is negative because it has more investment than its savings. But then after the shock, it turned out that the saving increase is so large such that now they have more savings than its investment. So then it means that its international lending and borrowing position turns from borrowing to lending. So in conclusion, that from this example, we show that for an economy that faces the real world interest rate at R1, then given the shock, they are going to have their foreign lending increases, which also implies that its trade surplus should increase. On the other hand, if the economy faces a world real interest rate that is at R3, then it means that its net foreign borrowing decreases. In these cases, it turns from borrowing to be lending. And same thing happened to its trade balance, that it turned from trade deficit into a trade surplus. Finally, for an economy that faces the world interest rate at a position of R2, then it moved from a zero balance to a position now becomes a net lender. So then they have more trade surplus in this case. So these are the two examples related to the shock to a small open economy, then what happened to its goods market equilibrium, and also what happened to its international lending borrowing position as well as to its trade surplus. Now let's look at the saving and investment in a large open economy. So then what is a large open economy? Well, it is an economy that is large enough to affect the world real interest rate. So it is just the opposite of a small open economy. For a small open economy, it is so small to affect the world interest rate. Therefore, they are always given the world interest rate and their choices will not affect the world interest rate. But for a large open economy, because it is so large, such that its decision about savings and investment will affect the world real interest rate. Because of that, when we want to analyze the saving and investment of a large open economy, we often assume that there is only two economies in the world. One is called the economy of our interest, which is a large open economy. Then the other is called the rest of the world, which is abbreviated as ROW. Therefore, the real interest rate somehow is moving to equate the desired international position for lending and borrowing by one country to the other. For example, if the country we are interested in, which is a large open economy, has a desired international borrowing position, and it means that for the rest of the world, it then needs to be in the net international lending position. On the contrary, if the country of our interest is a net international lender, then it turns out that for the rest of the world they sum up will be the net international borrower. So then as you can see in here, when we want to see the goods market equilibrium for a large open economy, we need to draw the equilibrium of two economies. One is country A, which is a large open economy, and the other is the rest of the world. So then when the goods market equilibrium need to happen, then it means that if the world real interest rate is at this position, then it implies that for the large open economy, its investment is greater than its savings, which means that it is a net borrower. Then in that case, it means that the rest of the world need to provide the fund that to finance the gap of the large open economy. So then the borrowing of the large open economy 
will become the lending of the rest of the world. So then, in that case, should there be any changes in the equilibrium of the large open economy, then it will affect the equilibrium of the rest of the world. That is, for example, if the economy turns out to invest more, therefore the changes in the equilibrium of the real interest rate of the large open economy will affect the world and it will change the saving and investment decision of the rest of the world. So we claim that any factor that increases the desired international lending position of a country relative to the desired international borrowing will cause a fall in the real world interest rate. And if such a change happens, it will decrease the desired international lending of the rest of the world. So then the equilibrium of the real world interest rate is determined such that a current account surplus, that is a net foreign lending in one country, need to be equal the magnitude of the current account deficit of the other country. Therefore, any factor that increases the desired international lending of a country relative to the desired international borrowing of another country will cause the world interest rate to fall. On the contrary, if there is any factor that decreases the international desired lending of a nation relative to its desired international borrowing of another country, it will cause the world interest rate to increase. So basically, any factor that affects the saving and investment decision of any of the countries of large size will affect the world real interest rate. So in here, we complete the discussion related to the saving and investment for large open economy. And this is the end for today's lecture.